hi and hello Chris here thanks for stopping by I do appreciate it just disregard the lighting and the background I just moved it's a work in progress but you know that's not what we're here about we are gonna jump into some more true crime and it seems there's a lot of interest in Canadian true crime so I have another one for you today let's get right into it it was November 27, 2010, and around 9.35 p.m., Aaron Keller, he was a constable with the RCMP, was driving along Highway 27 in North Central BC, and suddenly he saw a black pickup truck come out of some abandoned logging road and come onto the highway. Now, red flags immediately went up for the constable. I mean, why was someone out here on a cold winter's night on an abandoned logging road. Now he was waiting for backup, which is common around these kind of areas that are kind of remote and stuff, and his partner was in another squad car not far not far away. So the officer just kept pace with the truck and he noticed that the vehicle was not only going about 15 to 20 kilometers above the posted speed limit, but the driver himself was driving erratically. When Keller could see the other officer was in sight, he threw on his lights and pulled over the truck. He was surprised to see that the driver already had his license and registration out of the window and was waving them around. He noticed right away that this was a young man in the vehicle and the officer started the dialogue by asking the man why he was even out there. What you doing? I mean, that's not what he said. But you get the idea. The driver did not seem nervous or out of sorts. He replied in a calm manner that he was just going over to his grandfather's house. While the conversation was going, the officer noticed right away that the driver wasn't dressed like one would be in the middle of winter. I mean, it was really cold. It was snowing and the driver himself was only in a pair of shorts and a light sweater. The officer also noticed that there was a smear of blood on the driver's chin and a couple of drops of blood on his thighs. And once again, his red flags were going up and the officer started glancing around the cab and he also noticed that there was a can of Lucky Beer behind the driver's seat. Well, an open can of alcohol was all that was needed to ask the driver to step out of the vehicle. Now casually the driver stepped out and Keller was able to look around the vehicle a bit more. He noticed a small puddle of blood on the floor mat. Now the constable told the young man to go wait in the police car as it would be warmer there but in order to do that they would be searching him and his vehicle for their safety. The driver didn't argue. In fact he just nonchalantly said yeah sounds all right. So patting down the man's clothes, they found a few items like the cell phone, wallet, and stuff like that, but they also found a tool. It was one of those multi-tools with several different blades and tools on it, and opening it up, they saw more red stains on some of the blades. When the officer asked what the blood was from, the driver stated, well, it had only been used on some grouse earlier, but that didn't fly with the officers, and they said as much. The driver then said that, well, we also used it on a deer. Questioning him further, the young man stated that he met up with a friend and they came across a deer. His friend shot the deer, but I guess they didn't hit it properly and the deer ran away. They then went and tracked the deer and ended up killing it. Now poaching is illegal, so the officers decided to call in the conservation officer from BC Con Conservation Services. So while they were waiting for the other officer to arrive, they continued to search the truck, look around. Now inside they found two crack pipes, a wrench with more blood on it, some alcohol, and a backpack. Now this backpack brought up even more suspicion as it looked like it was it belonged to a young girl. I mean it was in the shape of a monkey. Looking inside this backpack they found a wallet that contained a health card belonging to a Lauren Dawn Leslie. Something wasn't right and the officer knew it. So Keller went back to his police car where the driver of the truck was sitting and stated that he was being arrested for poaching under the Wildlife Act. 
He was advised of his legal rights, and the young man said, I mean, this isn't verbatim, but he basically said, I know what I did was wrong. We were poaching, but it was the first time this year. I'm a redneck. That's what we do for fun. And then he laughed. Around 11 p.m. that night, the conservation officer, uh, Cameron Hill, he arrived and was briefed by the other two officers. He advised the young man again of his rights and asked for a statement. Now, Hill, he did not believe him. He had over 30 years experience in this field, and he knew something wasn't right about the story with the deer. And especially the way he was dressed. People just don't go out into the middle of the night, in the middle of the winter, and hunt in a pair of shorts. And too many things were just not adding up. So Officer Hill, he decided to actually take a drive down the old abandoned logging road to actually try to find this deer that they were hunt that they had hunted. And while this conversation was happening, Constable Sadu, which was the other officer, called into dispatch to do a check on the ID that they found in the backpack. It came back that Lauren Don Leslie had been reported missing. Now, they had trusted their instincts and they knew something was just not right with this guy and now their suspicions were validated. Now, they didn't really say anything about what they learned right away and Constable Hill went up onto the logging road. He could actually see the truck tracks that were still visible in the fallen snow and they were on the side of like this gravel pit type area. Where the truck tracks ended, he could see the footprints leading away into the bush. Now you have to remember, this is about 11 p.m., so it's dark, and it's in a very rural area. So Hill turned on his flashlight to see the tracks better, and that is where he saw some of the blood on the snow. Something or someone had been dragged into the bushes. He started following the trail, going through the heavy bush when suddenly he stopped. In an area full of willow trees lay the body of a young girl. Her hair was matted with blood and you could clearly see that her face had been battered. Now Hill ran back to his truck and radioed in to the other constables that it was the worst case scenario. Lauren Don Leslie, she was just 15 years old and in grade 10 at Nechaco Valley Secondary School in Vanderhoof. She was a caring, compassionate young girl who lived with her mother. She had been born with a genetic disorder that actually left her legally blind in one eye. But despite this, she never let that get her down and she had a zest for life. She enjoyed tubing, swimming, boating, and she even excelled in karate. Lauren had also been diagnosed with depression, but most people would absolutely never know that because she always appeared to be so very happy. Her father later recalled that she just seemed like a normal, happy, everyday teenager. Her parents separated when she was just seven years old, but both parents had a very active role in her life and it did not even slow her down at all. Lauren's father saw her around 3 p.m. on November 27th and she seemed happy as she headed down the road to her mother's house. She was going to go spend time with her mom. And around 8 p.m. that night, she told her mom that she was just going to go have a coffee with a girlfriend. Unfortunately, that was the last time they would see Lauren alive. 12.07 a.m. on November 28th, Cody Allen Lethbikoff was arrested and charged for the murder of Lauren Leslie. And not surprising, Cody denied killing the girl, saying that he found her like that. And even though he was advised that he could call a lawyer, he just kept saying over and over, I want to call my dad, I want to call my dad. The constables kept telling him, you know, you have the right to call a lawyer. He just kept repeating, I want to call my dad, I want to call my dad. So back at the Vanderhoof RCMP station, Cody had been booked and placed in interrogation room. Cody talked about his job at the Ford dealership, talked about his current girlfriend, and then got into his story about what actually happened that night on the logging road. He claims he was just driving along and saw some blood tracks in the snow and decided to follow them. He said he got out of his vehicle, found the wrench, backpack, and cell phone just laying on the ground, picked them up, and then that's when he noticed the foot tracks. He decided to follow the tracks and that's when he came across the body of Lauren Leslie. 
Now he stated he rolled her over, knew right away that she was deceased, and then got the hell out of there. Basically, he was just saying he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Now the interrogation continued for hours and hours, and the constables were wanting step-by-step -step details into what happened. They actually even brought up another murder of 35-year-old Cynthia Math just to see you know, Cody's response. Cynthia Mass was a well-known prostitute and her body had actually been found in L.C. Gunn Park about seven weeks prior on October 9th. You see, there were a lot of similarities between the two girls and how they had been attacked. So was there a connection? Now the constable suspected that there was a lot more to Cody and he had a hunch that there were other murders that were actually linked to him and that Lauren had just been his latest victim. The next day, the interrogation began again, but this time Cody admitted that he actually knew Lauren Leslie and in fact met her a few weeks earlier. They had initially met on a social networking site called Nexopia, Nexopia. and I personally have never heard of that, but apparently it's a, it's a pretty big site. And he said that on November 27th, he did plan on going to see his grandfather, but arranged to meet Lauren on his way there. The two of them were hanging out. They had some alcohol. They had sex, consensual sex. That's what he said. Then they decided to go off-roading. That's where he said the trouble started. Now, according to Lechbakov, as they were driving along, Lauren all of a sudden started acting weird and started slapping herself in the face and yelling that she hated life. She was screaming at him to stop the truck. He then went on to say that she grabbed the wrench that was sitting on his floorboard, jumped out of the truck, and started hitting herself in the head and the face until she fell onto the ground. He said he freaked out, grabbed her by her, her shirt, dragged her into the bushes, and then got the heck out of there. Now there were way too many inconsistencies with this story, and when questioned, he changed it up yet again. Now the officers knew that they were getting somewhere because forensics would prove that the angles in which the blows to her head made contact could absolutely have not been self-inflicted and the fact that his story just kept changing every time he told it. Several hours later, Cody finally confessed that he was the one that hit her with the wrench, but he still insisted that he did not kill her. Now, after all this, there was a 10-month investigation, and on October 18th, 2011, Cody Lechbakov not only would be charged with the murder of Lauren Leslie, and because they had matched DNA samples and through all the forensic testing, he would also be charged with three new counts of first-degree murder. He was also charged with the murder of Jill Stachenko. She was 35 years old. As far as they could tell, she was Lechbakov's first victim. But of course, they're not 100% certain. There could have been others before her. Now, Jill was a mother of six, four boys, and two girls. She went missing on October 22, 2009. Her body was found only four days later in a gravel pit just outside of Prince George. Cynthia Mass, she was 35 years old and she was a mother of a little girl and was reported missing on September 23, 2010. Her body was found less than a month later on October 9th in L.C. Gunn Park. Natasha Montgomery was 23 years old. Now, Natasha was a mother of two and was actually known to have a pretty bad drug habit, but she was actually in the progress of getting better and getting sober. And in fact, she was doing a really good job at it. And her number one goal was to be the best she could be for her children. She loved those kids more than anything. She was reported missing on October 31st and her body has remained missing. So who was Cody Lechbakov? Well, he was described as just being a typical Canadian kid. He had loving, caring parents and he even got along really well with his siblings. He was well liked in school and he loved sports, both watching and playing. He was skilled at hockey, skiing, snowboarding, 
And everybody pretty much just described him as the boy next door. At the time of his arrest, he was just 20 years old. That means he started killing when he was in his teens, which is very, very rare. And he would be known as Canada's youngest serial killer. The trial began on June 2nd, 2014 at Prince George Courthouse. And after presenting 92 witnesses that included forensic experts, the Crown finally rested its case. Defense? Defense had called up no witnesses and no experts. In fact, they only called one person to the stand, Cody Lechbikoff himself. During his testimony, he claimed that there were other people involved in the killings, but he wasn't going to be a rat and call them out. He sat there on the stand and told a very detailed story about his involvement in all this. Now, I'm not going to go into details in this video because it is quite lengthy on what he did say in the, in the courthouse. But if there's enough interest, I can do an additional video on just that part alone. Comment down below if you guys want to know the details of the actual court proceedings and especially like his story. On September 9th, the defense actually wanted to take the first degree charges off the table and they wanted Cody to just agree to plead guilty to four charges of second degree murder. The prosecution looked at this request. The plea was denied. They continued on with the first degree counts of murder. Now the jury returned the very next day just before 6 p.m. and they returned with a verdict of guilty on all four counts of first degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with no parole for 25 years. In February 2015, Lechbakov actually filed an appeal, but you know, to no avail, it did not go anywhere. And as of today, he is still serving his time in Workworth Institution, which is a medium security prison in Ontario. So guys, that is the story on how Canada's youngest serial killer got caught and arrested. And that's all I have for you today. And I hope you guys found this one interesting. Comment down below. Let me know what you think of the story. And please be well and stay safe. Until next time.